the most important part is the process of learning how to become a scientist for pre-grad students. And if they know that, they will naturally adapt when, if they have a solid foundation, they will adapt to the, the changes. Welcome back to the Dairy Podcast Show. My name is Barry Bradford from Michigan State University. Today I'm honored to welcome Dr. Antonio Fasciola to the show. Uh, Dr. Fasciola acquired his BS and MS degrees from the Federal University of Vicosa in Minas Gerais, Brazil, before getting his PhD at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He then did a postdoc at the USDA Ag Research Service uh, before joining the faculty at the University of Nevada, Reno, from 2013 to 2017. Uh, after that, he joined the, the faculty of the University of Florida in the Department of Animal Science, where he's now an associate professor of livestock nutrition. He's got a lot of jobs there. He's the coordinator for the Animal Science Graduate Program and the Undergraduate Honors Program. He's currently mentoring eight graduate students and has already mentored 28 postgraduate trainees in the past 10 years, in addition to lots of undergraduates. And in fact, he's won three separate awards for mentoring at the University of Florida, and he's made big contributions to the scientific literature, having published over 170 peer-reviewed publications. So, Antonio, thank you for joining us. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Barry. It's great to be with you. I'm exhausted just reading everything you, you, you're up to, but how did you get here? What made you get interested in dairy science or the dairy industry, for that matter? Yeah, well... Well, as you mentioned, I, I'm from Brazil, and, and my family had a, a, a beef operation in the north part of Brazil in Pará State. We raised a beef cattle and our buffalo for, for meat, and that's how my passion for agriculture started. Uh, then I, I went south in Brazil to, uh, to get my bachelor's, and I started working um, in a ruminant nutrition lab as a freshman. And it was pretty much because there was scholarship available and I needed, I needed the money and that's how I started. My, my plan A was to go back and, and be a farmer. And then I, I, you know, I realized all the, uh, the opportunities related to research and I got really involved with that. And my mentor at the time did his PhD in Wisconsin, uh, with Dave Holmes. And that's kind of how the connection started. And I did an internship and then uh, did part of my master's in Wisconsin. And then I stayed there. And it's been 20 years that I'm in the U.S. Uh, as of uh, July this year. Wow. Okay. Almost half your life now, huh? Exactly. It's it's a weird feeling. You know, I'm, I'm not quite Brazilian anymore and I'm, I will never be quite American. Um, so oh, come on. <laughs> it's, it's that, you know, I'm in that limbo now. Ivonic Animal Nutrition is committed to ensure food security and safety while reducing the ecological footprint of animal farming. Its products and services use evidence-based solutions that seek to promote animal welfare and reduce reliance on natural resources. All this is underpinned by long-standing industry partnerships and deep customer understanding. Ivonics focus on efficiency, sustainable, healthy nutrition, and collaborations with livestock farming partners creates value for customers and consumers. This is off topic. What's if you had to point to one or two things, you know, that were are the biggest difference that culturally living in Brazil versus the U.S. You know, what what comes to mind? Ooh, I, you want to put me in a hot spot. Um, you know, in, in Brazil, I learned a lot. Uh, you know, my, my foundation for you know my for my my bachelor degrees, working in an environment that I didn't have a lot of resources, I think made me very resourceful, uh, very creative. You know, uh, we didn't have you know doing like room and collections. We didn't have money for cheese cloth, so we have to use like you know t shirts and. You know, uh, so that I think that taught me a lot, and then it, and it was very help. You know, it helped me a lot moving here, and then here, just uh, you know, the the professionalism, the way people uh, you know work towards achieving goals, and the organization, the society organization. I, I went to Wisconsin, 
and I got there and then, you know, the first winter came and, and I was like, wow, that's why people need to be so meticulous about, you know, making their silage and, you know, organizing their, their home because the winter comes and you have to be prepared and organized. So, so, you know, I, I really enjoyed uh, learning th- this new culture and, and also using the kind of the background that I had to kind of bring that resourcefulness, that, you know, creativity and dealing with obstacles to, to kind of overcome those issues. Yeah, that's an interesting perspective. It makes sense. Well, you're obviously very passionate about your work. What is it you like about being a faculty member? What really motivates you uh, every week to, to go get a lot done? Yeah, well, I think that there's many aspects of my job that I that I really like and that I'm very passionate about it. But I, I would say the human interactions are my favorite part, and I really like enjoy in, in working with students. I think we go back, you know, several years when we're talking about you know the teaching. We have like those online forums. Uh, so I, I really like teaching. I really like mentoring grad students. I enjoy my collaborations with other faculty as well, but you know, working with students is really what I think I enjoy the most, both undergraduates and graduate students, and I think that's that's what gets me up and excited about my job. If I didn't have that interaction, I you know, I think I would be doing something else. Well, I kind of expected that's what you'd say uh, <laughs> as your roles in, uh, you know, coordinating the honors program, the graduate program, in the department and the mentoring awards you've won. So based on that, I'm curious if you had to try to summarize the approach you take to mentoring young scientists, how would you describe it? How would you explain that? You know, it, it's very different than, a, than, at least for me, than a scientific method that we are so used to, you know, we, we study, you know, there's a methodology and it works and it doesn't work. And you kind of, you know, uh, uh, you know, working with, with people, I think for me, what, what has worked is, you know, having a, first of all, it's setting clear goals and have a, open dialogue and communication. I think uh, one of the biggest issues is that we are dealing with young people who are students, even if they're grad students, they're still students. So they're still learning how to be a professional. They're learning how to be a scientist. They're learning how to be nutritionists or, you know, animal scientists. So having that, you know, patience and communicating uh, not assuming things, I think it helps a lot. Um, and so that's kind of the, 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 the foundation is, is good communication. But I think, uh, you know, you, you really have to, to like what you do. Uh, you, you have to care about the students as people. And once that, uh, happens, I think the connection, the connections, it's a lot stronger and, they know you are invested on them and they are willing to go that extra mile. As you know, grad school can be very stressful, um, both mentally, physically, emotionally, and, and having, and I think when students have, know that they have someone that, uh, have, have their backs, I think that they, they are willing to, 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 to do, uh, you know, to do better. And I think everybody benefits. I think it can be a win-win situation uh, for the most part uh, when we are dealing with grad students, for example. Yeah, there's a lot of good insights there. I think one thing I wanted to point to, um, probably a, a small minority of the people listening to this would be mentoring graduate students, but many would be working with young people in, in some kind of mentoring role, either professionally or personally. And I think you made a really good point about just reminding yourself to have the patience, right? Thinking about even in raising kids, it's easier to wash the dishes yourself than teach your kids how to do it, right? But you have to think about the long-term payoff, not only for yourself, but for them, right? And I think uh, for people running dairy farms, it can sometimes be hard, like if they've done it their whole life, right? And you hire somebody in that hasn't been on a farm their whole life to have the patience to teach them how to do something that seems simple to them. Right. But if you can show that patience and, and, you know, teach a person to fish, so to speak, right, they can feed themselves. 
Um, so I think that's a really good point you made. One thing I wanted to ask you about, it's really popular in uh, education today to talk about how, okay, we have to train students that maybe five years from now will be asked to do jobs that don't even exist yet. But, you know, how, how can you possibly think about training people for jobs when they're changing so quickly? How do you think, what's your response to that? Does it influence how you think about training people? Yeah, that's a very good point. In fact, uh, uh, you're right. Uh, we've been talking a lot about that. We just, uh, I, you know, I, I was, I was following a search for a new associate dean, and people were talking about, you know, how we're going to teach the future. Um, when, I, when I, you know, I try to reflect on my own, uh, my own experience. For example, you're probably aware that I do a lot of nowadays. I do a lot of in vitro work and continuous culture. Uh, I have no training on that during, during my entire master's and PhD. I did only in vivo work. Um, I worked with specific, you know, things on like protozoa that I never almost, well, I, I've had a few papers after that, but really not, not a lot. So, so I think being adaptable, it's, it's really important. And nowadays it's, 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 it's uh, very clear that, uh, you know the the way we we are doing things now it's going to be very different than than in the future i i think if if we can still teach you know the fundamentals right so i i i have my lab meetings tomorrow so we discuss a lot about that you know the the scientific method that the their individual project even though it feels like their entire world right now it's it's only a piece of it and it, the most important part is the process of learning how to become a scientist for, for grad students and if they know that they will naturally adapt when if they have a solid foundation they will adapt to the, the changes so um because it's really it's really hard to have like a you know a you know a, a crystal ball and kind of you know, some people get really lucky if they are, for example, if 10 years ago they were working on methane or, you know, climate change, and now it's like a huge topic. So that's great. But for most people, they really need to have a solid foundation and they will adapt those skills. And we talk a lot about transferable skills. So the ability to solve problems, the ability to communicate well, the ability to interact with people in a positive way, those things are going to transfer from grad school to whatever job they get in the future. And whatever they, job they get, it will continue to change. Uh, even if they're, maybe faculty positions are the ones that change the least, maybe. Uh, but if they go to the industry, they will change jobs constantly uh, within companies or you know across companies, even faculty. I mean, we, you are a good example. You are, you know, teaching and research and administration work and, you know, things change. And I think if you have a solid foundation and if you work on those skills that can be transferable, I think you will set yourself to a success. Yeah, well said. Learning how to learn, learning how to manage and execute projects, right? All those things, heart hard to beat. What about if you're, if you're advising somebody who's... Um, thinking about which path to go for an undergraduate program, right? If you want to work in ag in the future, you want to be setting yourself up for a successful career where you have lots of choices. What kind of program would you think about for, you know, that kind of flexibility that you're talking about or how would you approach that? Yeah. One, one thing I would like to mention is that, you know, the importance of mentoring. So uh, like mentors, so finding, a diverse group of mentors and I di diverse, I, I mean, like it could be like, if you're an undergrad, it could be another undergrad that is like, uh, you know, maybe a year, you know, ahead of you and, and, and doing internships, exploring potential jobs. Internships are great. Uh, uh, having mentors, for example, you have your, let's say you're a grad student, you have your major advisor, seek out other, other mentors as well, because they will have different types of skills, different different uh, ways to approach things. They can be 
from your committee uh, members, but they can also be outside. They can be from different institution. You know, having mentors and have established that uh, uh, network is really important because it, it, it will it will expand your perspectives. So if you you, you know you, you mentioned there's so many opportunities now. I was, and that's good and bad in a way because students, they come to me and it's like, I don't know if I'm going to grad school or grad school or if I'm going to research or this. Um, and, and, and I didn't have that problem because my plan A was to be a farmer and that didn't work well because the family farm got sold. And then I had to kind of do research because it was, I was, you know, I was doing that and I liked that. Uh, so when you have a lot of options, you really need to explore that and in, in internships, study abroad, other things you can do to kind of see what you like, what you don't like. And again, having that network of mentors can also be very helpful to you know guide you through that process of so many options in front of you. Part of that is, I, I, you know, certainly the best students are not this way, but I know, you know, you and I have talked about teaching undergraduates before, and there's a fraction of students that kind of just seem like they're there just to check the box, right? And, and um, just get by because people told them they need a college degree. Frankly, there are plenty of students like that, right? Have you found good ways to try to like engage and inspire students like that to actually get them to sort of take ownership of their education and, and get more motivated? Yeah. That's uh, that's tough. I think you know part uh, part of part of that is 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 that innate or intrinsic, and for whatever reason. And I think a lot about that when I'm thinking about my daughter. What I need to do, you know, uh, you know, do I make her, you know, go through some difficulties so she learns, and then, or do I help her? And it's so difficult, and 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 very similar to students. I think. Uh, you know, be, be very open. I, I try to be very open with my students. Uh, you know, I'm talking, I'm teaching about nutrition and I'm talking about, you know, starch. And I'm also talking about, you know, what kind of jobs nutritionists, you know, do and, and what, in, and what they want to be in the future. And I try to be as honest as possible, uh, and, and, and tell them if, if they are not really committed, it's okay. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's their choice. But um, they need to think about how they will feel in the future when some, someone else that, you know, maybe they know will be their boss or if they can't afford a type of lifestyle that they enjoy. And, you know, so, so you know, that motivation, I think, I, you know, I tell them my, my personal stories and, and I hope to inspire them by doing that. But a lot of it, it's, it, it, it's really... Uh, you know, individual things. So that, that's, you know, I, I believe that I've had students from, uh, for example, that come from very good, you know, like wealthy families that could be like just coasting in, in school and they still like work really hard, even though they don't need, I, you know, I can clearly see. So, so, and in the other hand, it's on the other hand, I also have students from a very, you know, like poor backgrounds that overcome, you know, immense difficulties. So it's, it's very difficult to have like a one formula that fits all. I think you really need to be honest with students uh, and, and try to show them that, that it's, it's their, uh, uh, choice and and they have to live with the consequence of their choices at that moment so that's what i typically you've uh, mentored more than a couple dozen students now through masters or phd or postdoc programs and i'm sure you're in touch with the va the vast majority of them have any of them you know when you've circled back with them and you're just chatting shared things they were surprised by in their first jobs or things that you know, you took away and, and that influenced how you then mentored other students. I'm, I'm curious. Yeah, I, I, I have a group. I have a, you know, like a, you know, a WhatsApp group with my former students and we, we chat uh, and, and I tell them that they are my, you know, also my source of uh, 
you know, inspiration and, 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 and information and they help me guide the new students. Um, and we're always in, in touch as much as possible. And now they're spread in multiple countries. Uh, but, um, yeah, they, 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 you know, you know, I, I have all this, you know, now they're my colleagues. They even give me advice on, you know, how to do better. And, uh, and, and so that's really neat. Um, uh, yeah, we, I, I, I don't know if, you know, if they have told me anything like recently that I, that I, that I remember, but it, it's, it's interesting that I, I, you know, uh, some of them, are considering, you know, changing careers and I'm, I'm helping them. I'm still, you know, in touch with them. And as I said, you know, every once in a while, I reach out to them and say, hey, I'm, you know, having this, you know, issue in the lab, what, what do you guys think? And, you know, they, now they are more mature and, and and they can look back at their own experience. And, you know, you, you go, when you have an advisor, I'm sure this kind of, you know, brings truth for more uh, for most students there's going to be times that you kind of hate your advisor uh but i think once you kind of pass that and you you learn and you are kind of out there doing your you know real work you look back i was like wow i'm, I'm glad that you know antonio pushed me that way and i didn't want to do that but end up being a learning experience so it's it's fun to have those conversations another leadership thing i wanted to ask you about you have you would have among, you know, one of the larger groups for a research team in a, in a dairy science program or animal science. And um, I know I think about this a lot is when I'm thinking about bringing somebody new into the team, I'm worried every bit as much about how they influence the culture of the team as I am about their individual skill sets. How do you approach screening? Do you, do you think about that also? And how do you approach assessing that, which is difficult? Yes, yes, I think that's very important. So I, I have a mentor-mentee uh, agreement that uh, sets the goals and expectations both ways, uh, uh, questionnaires. But no matter no matter how much interview or you do, I mean, it, sometimes it's really hard. So one thing that I've done that really uh, helps is because you you may love a particular candidate, but that person may not be a good fit for your group. So what I do is I ask my students also to interview and to talk to this new, potentially new student, that gives them the opportunity to feel if that person is going to be a good fit in, into the group. Uh, sometimes you have like outstanding students that are not really a good fit for the, the particular group. Maybe they are really good at, you know, working by themselves, but they are not really good at, you know, uh, uh, team players. Um, or personality issues. So having my students participating in the selection process helps a lot because they also feel like they have a saying and they take it that responsibility to once we make a decision that they will help me have that person into the team spirit because they were part of the decision making. So I think that helps a lot. Yeah, I agree. It, it, yeah, has real screening benefits and also psychological benefits. Uh, it gives us sure. the opportunity to participate in the selection process. Uh, and once the student comes, that student feels welcome. He, he or she will know that the other ones also participated. So I think it creates a sense of community. And that's very important. So that's a, you know, a point that I, I'd like to make to the students who are watching uh, to you know, develop that positive relationship within your group and also outside your group. It's all about relationships. Uh, it will definitely help you to be more successful if you cultivate positive relationships from the custodian who is cleaning the lab to the secretaries who are processing your paperwork to the faculty, to the other students who are going to be your peers for the next 30, maybe 40 years down the road, it's really important to cultivate that positive relationships. So I want to bring this back. Uh, you know, we're both academics, but most of the people listening are not. I think 99% of what we talked about is clearly relevant across sectors, across industry and academia. 
Um, but it's maybe not the, the direct translation is maybe not always immediately obvious. But anyway, a lot of our listeners are early career professionals or they manage young professionals. Um, what advice or thoughts do you have to share about effective mentoring of young professionals, maybe in a in, say, a dairy farm context or an allied industry company? Um, any any more general thoughts? I, I think, if, you know, your time is the biggest investment you can make on young people. So dedicating your time uh, to sit with people one on one, provide, you know, listen, you know, be a good listener is something that I that I continue to work on as as, as an advisor, trying to trying to understand, you know, listen to understand and not to reply. Um, uh, uh, it's, 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 it's really important, I think. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, spending time understanding what the, the, the person needs and, 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 and investing your time, investing your resources. I've had students that I sent to other labs to learn new techniques. I've had students that, uh, you know, I, uh, paid for. Uh, training, statistical training, water modeling training, other things, so they can become better students. And I see that as investment in also in my lab because they will uh, uh, pay back at some, you know, somehow with productivity or with better, you know, better jobs. So investing your time, investing resources, listening, and 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 and, and I think those things will will go a long way and, and will come back to you as, as an investment in your own, uh, um, let's say, if, if it's a company, I think that it's very clear that the more you, you invest in your employees, the, you know, the, the better they, they turn out. Of course, that's not going to be true for 100% of the people, but I think if you invest on them, uh, you will get a return on that. Thank you. Yeah, I want to I want to tie in one thing you you know you highlighted there listening and I heard you say a couple of times earlier in the conversation that there's no formula there's no scientific method for helping a mentee sort of achieve their potential and um, that makes me I, I can't remember where I heard it but I I heard something once about you know the really best coaches out there if you're watching a game. Um, the best coach might be the one who's in one player's face screaming at him to get him <laughs> motivated. And then the next guy down the bench, he's sort of supporting him, giving him that, you know, reinforcement. And obviously in a work environment, you have to try to tailor these in a way that doesn't seem terribly unfair, but it's definitely true that different people need different prompts, right. To, to achieve their potential. And I think you kind of hinted at that a few times. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I try early on to understand the students with you know, questionnaires and also meeting one on one and also in a, in a, in a social environment. So maybe, maybe it can be like a social event for the department or, you know, a celebration in my house or something like that. So try to understand because you're right. Each person is going to be different. So some students, I have to say, Hey, we're not going to do that experiment. We need to take less samples. We don't need to do all that uh, because that's too much. You're not going to be able to handle all those samples. And some students, you have to kind of say, hey, we need to do more. This is not enough. Uh, so, you know, it, you need to, to understand the person to see how how can you make that person think. And some people could be that you need to kind of be firm and say, hey, you want to you wanna be successful. This is what you need to do. And for some people... It may be a very different type of conversation and approach. Well, I've enjoyed this. This is this is awesome. It's time for our famous three. Adaseo, a global leader in nutritional solutions and the provider of Smartamine M, the best in class rumen protected methionine product for dairy producers who want to optimize milk production, capture more value from their components, and maintain their lifetime performance of their herds. For more product information and to calculate your return on investment when you balance your feed with amino acids, go to milkpay.com. We can't let you go without our three famous questions that we uh, throw at everybody. And uh, I'm always amazed we get answers I don't expect at least one of these every time. So 
First of all, want to know what your favorite ag-related book or resource is. So I'll talk about resource because you know there's you know you know artificial intelligence, all things in you know there's so many different things. So I would say that lately, the last few months, I've, I've been playing with different things in artificial intelligence, but even like something something rather relatively simple like LinkedIn, and it's been so resource resource for me because you can spend hours like you know there's somebody talking about something and then you go in the link and there's a website that i never really knew existed and that's true for, for research for mentoring for teaching i mean it's so many things and trainings so i would say linkedin is a really great tool for you know expand your network and also learn different things that are you know going on so i've been enjoying uh, uh you know uh spending time kind of learning more about it um, and also communicating with a you know broad kind of uh, audience so I would say you know it's it's a very good resource good and hey a new uh, sponsor idea for the company <laughs> for the podcast no that I agree with you I use it a lot uh, okay second one what's your favorite book or resource outside of agriculture okay so out I mean there you know, I, I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm stuck in traffic and, you know, I'll, I'll give credit to my wife. She was like, why don't you listen to some audiobooks? And there's so many audiobooks that are good. So I'll tell you one kind of like basic one that I, one of the first that I listened to, which is How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. It's, it's a really nice book, I think. Uh, very easy to follow. Even if you're in traffic and you, you know, here, you know, half an hour here, half an hour there. Uh, so and you learn a lot of like uh, practical things that are, you know, helpful uh, professionally. Good. Okay. And then the third question, in your opinion, what sets successful professionals apart from those who are less successful? Tough question. I mean, it's it, so many things, uh, but, uh, you know, we touch on some of the things. I think the desire to excel, that hunger. I think it's really innate, uh, very dif difficult to teach. I mean, if the person doesn't want to learn, it's very difficult, uh, especially nowadays. I mean, uh, I teach big class, the principal of nutrition. You have 120 students. I mean, if you don't want to learn, it's really difficult. Uh, so I think that desire uh, has to be there. And some people find that early on and some people take a little longer to find. Uh, I think, you know, having goals and be able to set your priorities, we can't really do everything. Uh, so there's moments in time in your life that you need to focus on a few things and, you know, be able to prioritize. Uh, uh, it's, it's really important. Of course, I think if you have the discipline, if you are able, we all have to make some sacrifices. There's no way to get everything that we want at the same time. So sometimes the sacrifice is with, you know, less exercise or less, you know, time with your family. I mean, there's times that, you know, so be able to do that, be persistent in our, in academia. I mean, you get rejections, uh, you have to be persistent. But in the industry as well, if you work on sales, you need to be persistent. We talked about being adaptable, uh, learning different things, being a good learner. And, 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 and finally, I would say cultivate that support system. It could be your family, your friends, and network of people in your professional area. Uh, you know, there's going to be ups and downs, and they will help you both when you're up, but also when you're not doing great. I mean, that uh, network is really important. That was an impressive list, like all put together. I, if, if you come up with an acronym for that, you're ready for the motivational speaker tour. I, I'm impressed. That was good. Thank you. All right. Well, Dr. Antonio Fasciola, thank you so much for joining us on the Dairy Podcast Show. It was a pleasure. And I, I look forward to, you know, continue to engage with you and the audience. Uh, and feel free to reach out anytime and I'll be happy to, you know, continue the conversation. Thank you. So again, this has been the Dairy Podcast Show. Uh, if you haven't subscribed yet, hit that button before you forget. And this is Barry Bradford. We'll see you next time.